You turn in your Bible to Malachi. I want you to do that right now. I want you to get there now. Malachi, where is it? Where is it? Go to Matthew, turn left. I mean, go back one page. <laughs> um, making it easy for you today. I'm in a good mood. Otherwise, I'd sit here and watch it. Fiddle through your Bible looking for Malachi. We're in Minor Prophets. This is going to be fun. Tony started us off last week, and um, we're picking up the ball here. Malachi, um, the first few verses, we're going to still be in chapter one. We're going to start in verse six. But the first few verses, as you heard last week, really demonstrate and show God's love for the people of Israel. And then after this introduction, uh, we see Malachi speaking uh, the, about the oracle. And oracle in Hebrew, the Hebrew word masa, masa the, means a heavy burden. An oracle is a heavy burden that urgently needs to be taken off. You, so Malachi has taken off this burden and sharing it with the people of Israel. And this burden is going to kind of bite them a little bit, as we'll see in just a minute. And all of these oracles are a word from the a word of the Lord. You can see that in Scripture right there. They're a word from the Lord. And the messenger is Malachi. And he's the last, he's the last book in the Old Testament. He's the last prophet. And he's following uh, along with Haggai and Zechariah and Ezra and Nehemiah before him. In the in this context, Israel has returned from the Babylonian exile. At this point in Malachi, they have finished rebuilding the temple. I mean, some of these books were all about rebuilding the temple. They rebuilt it. But the temple was pitiful compared to Solomon's temple. They built it. They got it all the dimensions, et cetera, et cetera. But all the ornate gold, all the paintings, all the magnificent works of Solomon's temple never came back. They were stolen, taken away. But they had finally done that. But the people of Israel were despondent. They had a kind of a rundown city, a rundown temple. All the kingdoms around them were prospering. Uh, and they were in, in quite a bad way. And so Malachi uses four arguments, and they're called... Uh, prophetic disputa disputations. Disputation means you dispute. It's like apologetics. You're talking back and forth, back and forth about the problem. And this is a great way to teach stubborn people. And that would be me. And that would be you. So the way this form starts first, that God brings a charge against them. He says, bam, you've been doing this. And then the second thing that happens, they say, well, how are we doing that? I didn't realize we were doing that. Then third, God would answer that, tell them how they were messing up. And then he'd close it out and say, now, look, you got a choice. If you listen to me, you're going to have blessings. If you don't listen to me, you're going to have some warnings and some curses. And the first charge, and I love Oh, the, the, the sermon is polluted worship. The first charge is polluted worship. And you look at that. How can you pollute worship? Well, we're going we're gonna to find out. So we're going to read the uh, verses 6 through 10. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? If I'm a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name. And then listen, but you say, how have we despised your name? And answering, God answers, by offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. And God answers, when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? You present that to your governor, will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? 
and now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle a fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. Very interesting words. He starts with, doesn't a son deserve, doesn't a father deserve honor from his son? Uh, and a servant, don't they honor the master? And God is our father. God is our master. He's our heavenly father. He is our Lord, which means master. And he says to the priest, but you despise my name. The priests, the leaders of Israel, despise his name. And they said, well, that can't be. And all of Israel was really despondent right now. And the priests were leading this. They were just going through the motions, as we'll see a little later. All the other kingdoms were kind of prospering. They were laughing at the Israelites because they were, like I say, poor. They had just barely been able to build things back. And he says, look, if you gave these crummy sacrifices to a governor, what would they do? They could even kill you because when you bring sacrifices or your taxes to the king or the governor where you are, if you bring him junk, he's going to let you know and that could even cost you your life. So God says, even if you took what you're offering to me, if you took it to a human ruler, you would be punished. You're bringing junk to me. You're polluting my altar. And then he says some scary words. I have no pleasure in your gifts, and I wish one of you would just shut the doors and not even kindle a fire. Remember the fire kept burning, they kept lamps burning. I don't even want to see a fire coming out of the temple. Shut the doors turn out the lights, and just go away. Now, if that's not a scary <laughs> burden, oracle, that Malachi gave the Hebrew people, I don't know what is. You are just giving me your junk, and you are polluting my temple with polluted Worship. Now, let's look at a little bit different time. About 200, 250 years later, in this same temple that we're told that is right now in Malachi, it was really, really desecrated. Rome conquered Jerusalem in 168 BC for the first, first time they conquered them. And the guy that led it was called Antiochus Epiphanes. And he went into this temple, this very temple, and he had Zeus. He tore out the ark and put in an idol of Zeus, the Roman god. And then on the altar of incense, if you remember the temple, we studied the temple a lot. I mean, the tabernacle, is, the temple looks just like the tabernacle, except it's a building. And so, you know, there's the ark, then there's the curtain, the veil, and then right next to that, is the altar of incense. Okay, then there's the lampstands and the, the, the table for bread. And then outside another um, veil, there's the altar and then the wash basin between that altar and, and the temple. So this is right next to where the ark is. On this side of the veil, then the altar of incense, he made the Jews sacrifice a pig and burn it in sacrifice to Zeus right in this very temple. Now, that is one of the abominations of desecration events that happened in all the Bible. I mean, it, it, that happened. And what did the Jews do? Well, they rose up, led by a group called the Maccabees, and they 
ran out the, the Romans. They conquered the Romans, threw them out of the temple, and cleaned up the temple. So you see, the words of Malachi eventually hit, and the people were willing to lay down their lives to protect the temple and make it sacred and to worship properly. Now, does God, would God ever say that about Life Point Giles? Lord, would we ever be so lazy in our worship? Would our preaching ever be so lazy that we're giving God our junk? We're giving him our leftovers as we uh, give our tithe. We just give him leftovers. We don't give him our best. I don't think that ever will. This church is a blessing. You guys are filled with such love. I see that right now. You love being here. You're, you're filled with his spirit. But what was going on in Malachi's day could go on anywhere. And so when we come to worship, we want to be sure that we're here to worship in spirit and in truth and give God out. It gets a little worse as we go on. God, and this is, this is, I mean, it's almost funny. It's called weary worship. They're just so weary. It's, it's crazy. But before this, God tells us his plan. I'm going to read verses 11 through 14, so follow along. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For not my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Now he flips back. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, um, that is, its food may be despised. But you say, listen to this, what a weariness this is. Do you read those words? What a weariness this is. And you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or is sick, and you bring this as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it as an offering, but yet sacrifices the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Wow. So God gives them a vision of what his, what his purpose is. His name is going to, from the rising of the sun to its setting, in, in that period of time in the Old Testament, that just means everywhere. You know, as far from the east to the west, everywhere, the entire world, all the nations. And notice that, another clue from the prophets, all the nations, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles, all nations will honor my name, will fear my name, will bring me pure offerings and worship purely instead of polluted. And that's his, that's his goal. But what about Israel? What a weary, he's quoting them. He's using their words. What a weariness this is. They bring polluted offerings. They bring bad stuff like the cheater that promised his best lamb and he brings one that's crippled or sick, about to die anyway. He brings that in. He's cheating God. He's giving God his leftovers just like we can do sometimes with our, our finances. Their attitudes, they snort. This is weary. I'm, you know, huh, what am I doing here? And then he says, I'm going to curse those who cheat. Cursed be those who cheat me. And we're going to see about that in, in just a little bit. So they, they brought polluted offerings to God's table. 
they offered weary, weary worship, and they certainly did not honor or fear God. It's all a dreary, weary proposition, their worship. Now, do we ever feel that way coming here? Do I ever get up here? Do, I hope not. And look, oh man, it's a pain to be here, but snort. Here I am. Let's get started. How, how would you how would you like me to start a sermon like that? I mean, and you're all sitting there, oh, here we go again. Let's time to sleep. The preacher's getting up. Let's all take a snooze. Weary worship. I don't think. I know we don't do that here, and I pray we will never do that here. But let me tell you, there are times in your life, and I guarantee you, because I've been there and done that, not when I'm preaching, but, oh, it's a rainy, dark, cold day, you know, and you just want to, oh, man, I just like to roll over in the covers and stay in bed. Have you ever had that happen? It's Sunday morning. I don't really want to go to church that I have had those thoughts, although I got up and I went, but I've had those thoughts. But, you know, sometimes we do feel like that, and sometimes we act on that, and we stay in bed. Other times we come to worship, but we're not really listening. We're not really focused. We're not really looking hard in God's Word. And we go to work Monday like nothing ever happened. People ask you at work, how was, the, how was your weekend? That was fine, relaxing, normal, regular old weekend. You never even say, I had a great time at worship. God blessed our Sunday school. God blessed the, the, the worship service. Have you ever said that? Hmm. You need to think about that a little bit because when you're excited about being in church and you're worshiping with all your heart, Monday morning, you see people, you should tell them that. You had a great weekend. We had a wonderful service. We had a great, God's word just touched my heart and tell him how, tell them how he did. That's what God is asking us to do. And may we honor God in that way. The final point here that he's showing is is a tough point. And, and, and so kind of tie on your helmets here. We're going to read verses one through seven in chapter two. Oh, and now, old priest, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. <laughs> Indeed, I've already cursed them because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces and dung on your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord. My covenant with him was one of life and peace. Remember that. And I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear. And he feared me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth. No wrong was on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Then he goes on to say how they are the opposite. They're leading Israel astray. Dung, that's fecal material, you know. I'm going to smear it on your face of your kids. I'm going to smear it all over your offerings. I'm going to smear it on the offering plate. I'm going to throw it out. In this time when they worshiped in the temple, when they brought a sacrifice, as they were, they were actually cutting it up open, they would take the intestines out with the dung, and that had to be taken outside the city and burned. 
And so when God is cursing them, he said, I'm taking the refuse, the dung, and I'm going to smear it on you, and you got to go outside the city because you are filthy. You're unclean from this dung because of your weary, polluted, selfish, lazy worship. And that's what he's telling them. And you will be cursed. But if you listen to me, I love that, listen to me and take it into your heart and do what I ask you to do, you will have a blessing. And what is the blessing? Life and peace and fear. Now, I had never thought, and this is something the Lord showed me this past week as I was preparing, fear is a blessing. Have you ever thought of that? Fear is a blessing. And it's a blessing to fear and stand in awe of the Lord. Why? Because you come in here, you are in awe, you are fear, and you know the Lord and you love him, but you're in awe and you're seeking to worship him completely. Fear is also a blessing. If you are driving too fast on a curvy road and all of a sudden you about hit a tree, your adrenaline pumps up, your heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, you're shaking a little bit, you slow down. So fear and awe of God is a blessing. And when we're feeling fearful, sometimes that's a blessing because we know we're doing something we shouldn't be doing. I shouldn't be doing this. Well, that's a blessing. So fear is a blessing, but I want to talk briefly about life and peace because we know that life is all through the scripture is a blessing from God. Wages of sin is death in Romans 6, 23, but you keep reading that verse. But what? But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wages of sin is death, but, a great little word in the Bible, but the free gift is eternal life through our Lord. God offers life not death. The thief comes in only in, in John 10, 10 to, to steal and kill and destroy. I came that you may have life and what? And life abundantly. God's promise. And this promise of blessing and curses frustrates a lot of people, but you got to understand the heart of God. As we read in Ezekiel 18, 23, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God and not rather that he should turn from his ways and what? And live. God gives us life. And when we choose to ignore that, we see death, death of our relationship with him, death of our relationship with other people. Sin leads us to death. And eternally we are separated from him in hell. And the peace that we get is the peace I give you. The world can't give you in John 14, 27. You know that. And the peace in, in Philippians 4, 7, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We don't understand that peace. People who've gone through a great loss or suffering, they still have that peace, even though there's tears. They know they have that peace. These are the blessings that we have. And people fuss a bit. Well, how come God is so judgmental? And how can he be good and yet judge? Because God, through judgment, we have his grace. All through scripture, Adam and Eve sinned. They were judged, but then he gave them grace. We see this all through the world. He destroyed through a flood, but he's saved by grace, Noah. We just went through the whole book of Exodus the past year and a half, and we see the judgment against those who did not smear blood on the doorpost, the loss of their firstborn. But we see the deliverance through the water, just representing baptism of the Red Sea of a whole nation. God 
offer. God is a God who is righteous and he will judge us. But he provides that way of escape. He provides his son. And he takes no pleasure. And I love that verse. People don't remember that verse in Ezekiel. He takes no pleasure in any wicked person dying. And what does he say? Oh, that they should turn from his way, listen to him, and live. He wants everyone to be saved. But the world looks at it, oh, he's just a judgmental God. No, he will judge. He will judge everyone, every one of us. But he gives us the grace. He gives us this life. He gives us his peace that the world will never give, that people don't understand. He gives us all of this. When we listen, obey, and love him. And that is our great God. Because we all have this same choice. Every human has this choice. Life or death. And God wants us to choose life. May we worship in spirit and truth. Never, never a polluted worship. May we worship in spirit and truth and live in his glory, choosing him and the life, the abundant, the rich and glorious life that he gives us and the eternal life he'll give us when we leave this world. May we choose that life and not ignore him and choose death. And I pray, I know everyone here has chosen life and I am so thankful for that. But there are people in your lives you know who have not. And I pray that we all will take this seriously and share this truth with everyone. Pray with me. 